We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. But the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as liable to death. So Pilate gave his verdict. He handed Jesus over. Pontius Pilate is surely one of the most reviled people in all of history, at least for Christians. But why do we condemn him so readily? Perhaps because in him we see someone who could have known the truth, who should have known the truth, who would have known the truth if he had just listened to his wife, but who instead preferred to listen to the crowds, who preferred to wash his hands of the import of his own decisions, who preferred to ask philosophical questions about truth instead of grappling with the truth in front of his eyes. But the reality is, I don't know that I would have been any better. I might have, I might have been willing to put a man to death if it didn't require me getting dirt on my own hands. There are no heroes in this story. We are sinners as we walk with Christ along the way to the cross, and we need our Savior because we cannot save ourselves. And perhaps the lesson of Pilate is just that. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And a short reflection on the second station of the cross, Jesus taking up his cross. Um, I think back to last year in the build-up to Easter, uh, when in fact on Good Friday, uh, walks of witness were inadvisable, if not illegal. But I figured that being able to do individual exercise, I could undertake a run of redemption. So I fashioned a somewhat rough wooden cross, strapped it to the back of my rucksack and went for a run, bidding people good morning and God bless as I went past. The point is that it's not a burden. Um, we each carry our cross in some way, uh, spiritually, mentally, or morally, uh, each day. And sometimes it's not a burden. Um, other times it feels that the load is too much to bear. But we are never alone. And in that, there is freedom. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Are you the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it? Jesus falls the first time. Even Jesus found the burden and weight of the cross to be too much. He stumbled and fell under its weight. Like him, we sometimes find the burdens we carry to be too much to bear. Like him, we stumble and fall under the weight of them. Like him, we sometimes struggle to get up again. At times like this, it may take sheer determination and grace to get up and follow along the path. It may not feel it as we struggle on our own way of the cross. But the road we are on leads from cross to tomb, to resurrection, to glory. Amen.
We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. A sword will pierce your own soul too. Jesus meets his mother. Struggling, taunted, bowed down by the weight of the cross and by the sacrifice he's about to perform, Jesus searches for a friendly face in the crowd. Mary is there, filled with a mother's love, the intense desire to protect from harm, pierced through with pain for her child who is misunderstood, hated, and mocked. She realizes what is coming to pass, her son's sacrifice for all, but also her own personal loss, the loss of future hopes. I think of what's been asked of Mary as Jesus's public life grew. She had to step aside to make room for his new family of disciples. I think of the passage, who is my mother? Whoever does the will of my father is brother and sister and mother. So Mary offers up her presence as some small comfort to her son, even as her human heart is breaking. There are no words, no embrace. She's a silent witness. She stands strong as she watches her son follow his path. What is asked of us as mothers or those who mother others? Love and care and support that frees those in our care to find their path. May we feel the love of God and be a conduit of that love to others. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The weight of the world is even too much for the Son of God to bear. The kindness of Simon, just another face in the crowd, has been remembered for over 2,000 years. For a brief moment, he allowed Jesus to catch his breath, bearing the heavy, hard wood of the cross upon his own body. There was no way for Simon to stop the procession to Calvary, nor prevent the broken and bleeding man called Jesus from his eventual death there. But in reaching out and shouldering his burden, Simon perhaps gave the Nazarene a chance to gather enough of his flagging strength to see his journey through to the end. How might we, like Simon, reach out to help those who are struggling and weak, even though our assistance may seem small in comparison to their need. How might we trust that in bearing the burdens of our neighbors, we are providing a service 
to our crucified Lord. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. I had to look on the internet to find more information about Veronica and learn the story of how she offered a towel to Jesus as he carried the cross and the image of his face was left on that towel. When I saw the images on the internet, I was struck by one that was very familiar to me because when I took a course on painting icons, the image that was used for the first time icon painters was always this one, the image made without hands. The story that went with this was that there was a cloth placed on Jesus' face and his image remained on the cloth. I love that the myth of Veronica intersects with the myth of the image made without hands. There might be no connection at all, but we would hope that there was someone moved to pity and that if we were in that circumstance, we would be also. Maybe the myth of the images speaks to the hope that in showing mercy, we see the face of Jesus. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. On the road to Calvary, Jesus must have hit the ground much harder the second time he fell. His bodily strength had depleted, resulting to severe pains of his joints. The insults from the unruly crowds and soldiers had increased. Added to these was the increasing weight of the sins of humanity. He must have been tempted to give up as he turned weaker. The way of the cross was so cruel that those gestures of aid and sympathy from his blessed mother Mary, Simon of Siren, and Veronica seemed futile. They did not change the apparent hopeless situation, coupled with no strength to go on. However, amidst all of this, he doesn't let go of the cross. So he rises up and continues on to Calvary. Lord, in our moments of anxiety, weakness, and shame, that we become overwhelmed and even fall, help us to rise again by your grace and strength. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? We don't know how genuine these women's sadness is, whether they are professional mourners, whether they are outraged by the execution of an innocent man, whether they are followers of Jesus that he knew from before. Um, there's very, it's, a very, it's a short passage with very little detail. This Easter and, uh, and this, this Holy Week and um, the one last year, 
have been full of death. We've been living through a pandemic of biblical proportions. Over 100,000 people dead from um, uh, COVID here in Italy. Over 2,770,000 around the world. There's other famines of biblical proportions uh, that I learn about in my work at the World Food Programme. Hundreds of millions of people marching towards starvation in conflict-ridden countries around the world. There is so much suffering. And some of that suffering is captured in this passage. When there is death, when you greet someone who is bereaved and you try to connect with them, it can be difficult. Jesus, even minutes or hours before his death, still ministers, still acknowledges their existence, still tells them not to weep for him, but for themselves and their children. He reaches out. It is still a moment of sadness, a moment of pain on the Via Dolorosa. But we know that resurrection and joy is only a few days away. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I recounted my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Let me understand the teaching of your precepts. Then I will meditate on your wonders. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. A whipping, a heavy cross, and a steep hill, and a place of horrendous suffering and humiliation ahead. Jesus must have been filled with doubts and with pain. A stumbling block indeed. This was his third fall. He had help to carry the cross earlier, and his cross was the whole thing, not just the cross piece like the others. But still, heavily beaten and exhausted, he was physically struggling. And who knows what emotion he was working through. Faithfulness in the face of fear, in doubt, desire for deliverance, and anger, all of the human emotions so well known to us. He needed personal courage and the grace of God to persevere. The courage and grace needed to continue is ours too, if we ask. So in face of difficulties, sorrow, and doubt, ask for these and get up again like our Lord showed us how but remember how much pain and humiliation he endured to teach us Amen We adore you O Christ and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They gave me gall for my food, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. By the time we arrive at the tenth station of the cross, Jesus is stripped of his garments. We can only remember what it means to be clothed. Remember, it was Jesus that said, I was naked and you clothed me. Clothing is a way of protecting someone, taking care of someone. They're not just a form of status, of rank or wealth. So to remove the clothing and to remove it so forcibly is to reduce someone, not only to dishonor and shame, but also to humiliation and to a complete and utter sense of vulnerability. This station is one I like to think brings Jesus closer to the experience of those among us who know the punishment of being forcibly stripped. In our society, this still and sadly often happens to women. 
and also some men, of course. I can't help but recall here all the women who have, who have and will be part of Jesus' suffering. Mary, Veronica, the weeping win women of Jerusalem. Is it any surprise that there are so many women present in Jesus' humiliation and dishonoring? That they walk with him at this moment, the way he walks with them? This is an experience that many women and some men know too well, and one in which we may find comfort that God in his human form was also reduced to. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Jesus nailed to the cross. So here we are faced with humankind's enormous capacity to assert power and mete out cruelty when driven by fear. How do we respond? Earlier this week, I had the unusual privilege of speaking to another Galilean, a retired Melkite archbishop named Elias Shakur. In 1948, when Elias was eight years old, he was displaced with all of his neighbours from his village by Zionists. He witnessed for himself violence and destruction at the hands of people driven by fear. Yet despite this, he has devoted his life to promoting reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians. And when asked why anger hadn't consumed him, he replied, anger simply devours the one who is angry. Look at Christ. How did he respond to abuse by those who hated him, not in accordance with their actions, but in accordance with his mission. So let us move beyond anger at this station. For Jesus nailed to the cross invites us to question how we respond when faced with the world's violence. Can we hold fast to our mission? Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. That when the sun had darkened, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. The twelfth station, Jesus dies on the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that Jesus breathed his last. But John terms it this way, Jesus handed over his spirit. It's the same word used when Pilate handed over Jesus to the soldiers to be crucified. As Pilate was in charge of his soldiers, Jesus was in charge of his fate and his soul. On the cross, before dying, he hands over his mother Mary to the care of the beloved disciple John and hands over the care of John to his mother Mary. And as he dies, the curtain in the temple that kept people out of the Holy of Holies was rent asunder from top to bottom, and his death meant that we now have access to the very heart of our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Amen.
We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. The 13th station, Jesus' dead body is removed from the cross and embraced by the same arms that embraced him as a child, newborn in that manger in Bethlehem. Mary, the Blessed Mother, embraces her son with the arms of love. In the beginning, love of anticipation and joy, and now the love of sadness and gentleness that often grip us at the time of death. The Holy Mother embraces her son, weeping from her own heart, knowing full well that Jesus not only died of the pain inflicted upon him by the ruthless, but he also died of a broken heart, longing for those that he loved. Death brings this out in us. Today we're called to respond with the same gentle love to others with which Mary reached out to her own son, longing for them as she longed for him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, sinners, now and at the hour of our death. death. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. We do what we can. They slip from us, these people that we love. They pass quietly. Perhaps they die violently. And in such moments, we have a duty. We bury them. It's what we do. There is an ordinary sadness to these human and family duties. Even Pontius Pilate knows that something must be done to close this chapter, to dot this I, to cross this T. And so he permits Joseph to take away the body of Jesus and bury it. Joseph of Arimathea walks away from the tomb, having fulfilled the ordinary duties of friendship. We're done. Were we to discover another chapter to this story, it would be one beyond human confection. It would come to us from the side, out of the blue, through the imprecise light of dawn in a garden. It would be unexpected. It would not only answer a question, it would pose the question to which it is its own answer. How powerful is love? To what length will God go to love his creation, to repair what has been broken, and to bring to completion what he has begun? Almighty and eternal God, on the edge of sadness, when all seemed lost, you restored to us the Savior we thought defeated and conquered. Help us to empty ourselves of self-concern, that we might see your hand in every failure and your victory in every defeat. These things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.